Good morning to everyone who has joined us today in our KBF online service. It is truly a blessing that we can still meet online to worship the Lord and also to listen to His Word through the message later. Psalms chapter 100 verses 1 to 2 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. So, let us start our online service today by singing the first song as we prepare our hearts to worship God. Darkness. 
seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold, oh, oh King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Our scripture reading this morning will cover several passages. Genesis 1, 27. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Ezekiel 28.15 You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Isaiah 14.12 How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. John 10.30 I and the Father are one. Revelation 22, 12-13 Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Hello KBF family and guests. I took the liberty of coming down here. I know most of you miss this place, so hopefully one day we'll, uh, we'll be able to, to come back here and uh, worship together. I intended to introduce our, uh, our speaker today, but for reasons uh, uh, he will share with us only at the end of his message, uh, you'll have to, to wait and see uh, why. He didn't want to be introduced. Nevertheless, he tackles a very difficult topic of free will and who Jesus really is. And you can see this from uh, the scripture readings. And he's also touching on the four main pillars of the Bible, the books of Genesis with the creation, the book of Isaiah, with the prophecy about Christ and the fall of uh, Satan. The book of Matthew, where Christ fulfills prophecies and also his um, forgiving sins, which only God can do. Finally, the book of Revelation, with Jesus' promises that he'll return. So join me as we pray together. Spirit of the living, living God, we are here to receive your word. I pray that your spirit enables our speaker to deliver an accurate message. And I pray for everyone watching or listening at home to understand the message and apply it in their lives. We're not here to receive information, but we are here to experience transformation. And you can do this in our homes just as well as when we are gathered around at KBF. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings to all that are watching. This message is intended especially to those in Malaysia at KBF, but not only. Salamat pagi, semoga Tuhan bersamamu. Let's get right to it and tackle the topic of free will. As Christians, we believe that an evil power has made himself for the present the prince of this world. And of course, that raises problems. Is this state of affairs in accordance with God's will or not? If it is, he is a strange God, you will say. And if it is not, how can anything happen contrary to the will of a being with absolute power? But anyone who has been in authority knows how a thing can be in accordance with your will in one way and not in another. It may be quite sensible for a mother to say to the children, I'm not going to go and make you tidy the schoolroom every night. You've got to learn to keep it tidy on your own. Then she goes up one night and finds the teddy bear and the ink and the French grammar all lying in the grate. That is against her will. She would prefer the children to be tidy. But on the other hand, 
It is her will which has left the children free to be untidy. The same thing arises in any regiment or trade union or school. You make a thing voluntary and then half the people do not do it. That is not what you will, but your will has made it possible. It is probably the same in the universe. God created things which had free will. That means creatures which can go either wrong or right. Some people think they can imagine a creature which was free but had no possibility of going wrong. I cannot. If a thing is free to be good, it is also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, of creatures that work like machines, would hardly be worth creating. The happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in an ecstasy of love and delight compared with which the most rapturous love between a man and a woman on this earth is mere milk and water. And for that, they must be free. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it worth the risk. Perhaps we feel inclined to disagree with him. But there is a difficulty about disagreeing with God. He is the source from which all your reasoning power comes. You could not be right and he wrong any more than a stream can rise higher than its own source. When you are arguing against him, you are arguing against the very power that makes you able to argue at all. It is like cutting off the branch you are sitting on. If God thinks this state of war in the universe a price worth paying for free will, that is, for making a live world in which creatures can do real good or harm and something of real importance can happen, instead of a toy world which only moves when he pulls the strings, then we may take it it is worth paying. When we have understood about free will, we shall see how silly it is to ask, as somebody once asked me, why did God make a creature of such rotten stuff? that it went wrong. The better stuff a creature is made of, the cleverer and stronger and freer it is, then the better it will be if it goes right, but also the worse it will be if it goes wrong. A cow cannot be very good or very bad. A dog can be both better and worse. A child better and worse still. An ordinary man still more so. A man of genius still more so. A superhuman spirit best or worst of all. How did the dark power go wrong? Here, no doubt, we ask a question to which human beings cannot give an answer with any certainty. A reasonable and traditional guess, based on our own experiences of going wrong, can, however, be offered. The moment you have a self at all, there is a possibility of putting yourself first. Wanting to be the center, wanting to be God, in fact. That was the sin of Satan, and that was the sin he taught the human race. Some people think the fall of man had something to do with sex, but that is a mistake. The story in the book of Genesis rather suggests that some corruption in our sexual nature followed the fall and was its result, not its cause. What Satan put into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could be like gods, could set up on their own as if they created themselves, be their own masters, invent some sort of happiness for themselves, outside God, apart from God. And out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery... The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. 
The reason why it can never succeed is this. God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on gasoline, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn, or the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. That is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself, because it is not there. There is no such thing. That is the key to history. Terrific energy is expended. Civilizations are built up. Excellent institutions devised. But each time something goes wrong. Some fatal flaw always brings the selfish and cruel people to the top. And it all slides back into misery and ruin. In fact, the machine conks. It seems to start up all right and runs a few yards. And then it breaks down. They are trying to run it on the wrong juice. That is what Satan has done to us humans. And what did God do? First of all, he left us a conscience, the sense of right and wrong. And all through history there have been people trying, some of them very hard to obey it. None of them ever quite succeeded. Secondly, he sent the human race what I call good dreams. I mean those queer stories scattered all through the heathen religions about a god who dies and comes to life again, and by his death has somehow given new life to man. Thirdly, he selected one particular people and spent several centuries hammering into their heads the sort of god he was, that there was only one of him and that he cared about right conduct. Those people were the Jews, and the Old Testament gives an account of the hammering process. Then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has always existed. He says he is coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now let us get this clear. Among pantheists, like the Indians, anyone might say that he was a part of God, or one with God. There would be nothing very odd about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God in their language meant the being outside the world who made it and was infinitely different from anything else. And when you have grasped that, you will see that what this man said was, quite simply, the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. One part of the claim tends to slip past us unnoticed because we have heard it so often that we no longer see what it amounts to. I mean the claim to forgive sins, any sins. Now, unless the speaker is God, this is really so preposterous as to be comic. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toe and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for treading on another man's toes and stealing another man's money? Asinine fatuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven, and never waited to consult all the people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply what I can only regard as a silliness and conceit, unrivaled by any other character in history. Yet, and this is the strange significant thing, 
Even his enemies, when they read the Gospels, do not usually get the impression of silliness and conceit. Still less do unprejudiced readers. Christ says that he is humble and meek, and we believe him, not noticing that if he merely a man, humility and meekness are the very last characteristics we could attribute to some of his sayings. I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Thank you so much for listening to my message. My name is George, and I've spent about two years in Kuala Lumpur, so I'm pretty sure that I've even met some of you guys. I only decided to reveal myself at the end of the video because I didn't want the message to be discounted by the messenger. I am well aware that in Asia, and in most parts of the world, it is usually the elder people that share their knowledge and experiences with us younger ones. I may be only 15, however, I have read how God has used the youth in the Bible. For instance, Solomon writes in 1 Proverbs 1.4, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Too often nowadays, young people are given a free pass when, when elder people want to put responsibility on their shoulders because they just don't believe that we can handle it. However, Solomon did not share this view. He clearly believed that we could learn to be intelligent and wise and be good members of society. Another example is Josiah. He inherited the kingdom of Judah at a mere age of eight years old. That's about how old my brother is now. And he began to seek after God at 16 and began to reform the nation. Another example would be in 1 Samuel 17, 33, when David versus Goliath. Saul clearly did not believe that David could be could beat Goliath. He said, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. However, we all know how that fight turned out. I'm, I know that most of you guys are college students, so we are considered the youth. So I want to end with a prayer with what Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12. Dear Lord Jesus, Please do not let anyone look down on us because we are young, but help us to set an example for believers in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Thank you very much, and I hope you have an excellent week serving the Lord. Counsel to the Lord, who can question any of His words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all these wondrous things? Behold, now God seated on His throne. Let us adore.